Hello everyone, my name is Carlos Leon, as you heard earlier. Originally I'm Colombian, I'm working for Container Solutions as a software engineer, and I'm helping Container Solutions uh, and customers to build programmable infrastructure to help with the automation of their processes and whatnot. And what, and what today I'm going to be talking about is uh, scheduling Docker containers, or just schedule my containers, please. Thanks. All right, let's do a pre-flight check. I assume if you come to this talk that you know a little bit about computers. It's a fair assumption, but nevertheless, about CI/CD, continuous integration and continuous delivery, zero downtime deployments. Maybe you have heard about it. Maybe not. It's not completely necessary. Monoliths, buzzword, microservices, more buzzwords, high availability. Uh, scheduling. Big data, <laughs> web scale. Oh yeah. Whoa. Fuck yeah! And all those are just serverless. Is the latest sexy. Shit. <laughs> Next oh, time. Yeah. Serverless. Oh, no, no, thank you, Bob. <laughs> cool. Now let's pretend that you guys have an application. It's a application that runs uh, both on web and the, the 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 user comes here using their computer and they use. Uh, Internet Explorer 6 and they access your application and they're very happy. And they access uh, your application with this uh, beautiful baby Nokia uh, because you have a mobile application, right? And if you think about your stack, normally it would look something like this. You have your data center with a bunch of uh, resources that you can dispose from. And the industry has tell you, okay, you can basically classify your servers in your data center in load balancers, HTTP servers, application servers, database servers, cache servers, GPU, image, video encoding, decoding, processing servers, etc., etc., etc. The problem with this is what if you are not anymore using monoliths that get deployed in a very old fashioned way, say FTP or SCP or Diskets that you go into the server, you put it, and then you copy paste kind of thing. What if you could treat your whole data center? If you could treat the data center as a whole, if you can, if you didn't have to talk to one server to deploy your application, but you talk to the data center instead. So initially, you start one server, which runs your nginx, ha proxy and your Tomcat or your Ruby or your PHP, FPM or whatever your application server is, you have one server. As soon as you scale up to another one, how do you provision that? And how do you deploy your application into, into that new server? What if it's not, not two servers but ten servers because you're getting more load? How do you split the responsibilities of your servers? Do you talk manually to each of the servers? Do you use any provisioning tool? to automate it, to make your life easier, like Chef, Puppet, Saltstack, Ambari, Ansible, Bash scripts. Do you use any of that? <coughs> okay, maybe you don't want to treat your whole data center as a whole, including your databases, because this part in the industry, there is still a lot of discussion and fuss going around it. It's fair to say that it's not yet figured out. <laughs> now, what if you could treat your, not your database, because okay, let's leave it aside for the rest of the talk. We know that stateful services are kind of complicated to manage, even more in Docker containers. Uh, but let's say that you could use all these resources as one single thing. How many of you guys are using Docker in production? How many of you guys are using Docker in your testing and development environments? Good, good. How many of you guys are working with Docker and microservices? And how many of those microservices also with monoliths? Anybody dealing with legacy applications in containers? Well, probably not to, but yeah. <laughs> Fair enough, you don't have to get to the future immediately, and it's, uh, it's a long journey. Yeah. We'll talk about that later. Now, this is where Docker Swarm wants to help you, because you have, uh, this is your data center, and you have a bunch of, uh, of hosts, 
of resources that are, let's say that they're running Docker. And for the sake of this uh, talk, let's pretend that we have a containerized application that can be deployed in anywhere because it's a stateless application and receives by, by via a environment variable the, the address of the database, of the cache servers, of the microservices that it needs to talk to, etc. How do you deploy it? Can anybody give me an example of how they're deploying it to production? Anybody care? How they're deploying to production? How, yeah, you have a Docker container and you have uh, your data center there or your, or your cloud provider. How do you put a container there? How do you put it into production or into your test server? Mm -hmm. I don't go to production, I think it was the two of you, right? Yeah. So to go to production is only the two of you who can tell. Any idea? Okay. Well, um, Docker Swarm is the answer. Right? Docker Swarm might be the answer, but what I've seen so far is people are using stuff like Chef, Puppet, Capistrano, Mina, Ansible. They create a unit file for systemd. Everybody knows what systemd, <coughs> who doesn't know what systemd is. Right, so systemd is just a, a, a Linux uh, tool that will run your service. It's like the old uh, etcd from Ubuntu or Debian or whatever. It's the, it's the future, it's like the latest shit. Everybody's moving towards their Red Hat, Ubuntu, even Arch Linux, Gen2, everybody. So you should, <coughs> check, you should check it out. <coughs> Anywho, I've seen people creating unit files and say, okay, this is going to be my Docker container. This is the unit file. When the system starts, make sure that you run this container. Then somebody from Ansible puts this uh, configuration file into the server, and they, that's how they deploy their servers. If there's a new version, they update the new version in the Ansible scripts or in the Chef uh, repository, whatever, on the cookbooks, run again, and it gets redeployed. This is a little bit troublesome, though, because then you have to manually manage your inventory file, or maybe you have something smarter to manage your inventories, but still, it's a little bit troublesome, and it doesn't feel very out of the box -ish. So, Swarm. The way that it works is it helps you treat your whole data center, your whole Docker host as one single unit. Then you, so you talk to one Docker host, but in the background you're talking to your whole cluster, like this. This is the Swarm Manager. It's running in one of your nodes in, in your data center. And here are your nodes, which basically they're just running Docker containers. This is running Docker daemon, this is running Docker daemon, daemon, and they all talk to the manager and say, hey, we're here, we have all these resources, we have Docker, please just give me some Docker image, some Docker container, and I will make sure that I run it for you. So at some point you talk to the manager, to the Swarm manager, and say, hey, Docker run microservice. And then the Swarm manager is going to go to one of the nodes, you're going to say, hey guys, I have this, uh, this container, can you please run it for me? And then the node will run it for you. <coughs> so this is, uh, this is your data center and this is your pool of Docker hosts. And as I told you, you need an entry point. The Swarm Manager is the one that you're going to be talking to. And it could be this one, for example. And, all, and the rest of these nodes are going to be reporting to this Swarm Manager. And they'll say, hey, we are your bitches, you can use us as you please. And so Swarm Manager at some point will go and say, okay, motherfucker, you're going to run my container, etc." But it doesn't necessarily have to be this very specific node, or this one, or that one. It could be the three of them. And ideally, it should be the three of them if you want to have a highly available data center. Now we're going to come back to this, because Swarm cannot really be highly available all the time. but. Let's get back to that later. So, um, the way that Swarm works in the sense that uh, the process of making a decision to, to see where it should run a container is by uh, using filters. Some of them are implicit and some of them are explicit. You see the pun? That's right, my fucker. Um, there is... <laughs> there is a... Uh, the constraint filter on which you manually say, tell to the, to the manager, hey, I want you to run this container only in these nodes, in, in, in the nodes that comply with this specification. So for example, uh, you may have uh, your nodes 
divided in three different groups, general <coughs> purpose or whatever. And you have ones that have like really GPU power for doing, for example, uh, image processing or video encoding, decoding, video streaming, for example, you need units that have like really good GPU units installed. Now, uh, you don't want to, uh, if you were going to run a really lightweight application like a web service that is really stateless and doesn't consume a lot of memory like a logging microservice, you don't want to run it here, right? Because it doesn't make a lot of sense. You're going to be wasting your resources. So in that sense, you want to run in the general purpose uh, cluster, or maybe it is, a, it is a Java application. We know how Java is really eager in memory. Also Ruby, Python, and oh. yep. So maybe you want to run these things here. And so this is uh, where the constraint filters come for Swarm. Health filter is a implicit one because when you tell Swarm, please run this container, it will make sure that it runs the container in a healthy node. This is kind of a really, not lame feature, but they just explicitly mention it. Hey, we, we will not run your containers on an unhealthy node. But I mean, like, can you? Can you run a container in an unhealthy node that is not responsive? Can you run a container in a node that you cannot even reach? Because these are, these are, this is the criteria to tell that a node is healthy that there is a connection and that there is enough resources available. And Docker Swarm will not run a container in a node that it cannot reach or in a node that doesn't have enough resources. There is also a con container configuration filter. Because say, for example, you have uh, two different containers that depend on each other and you don't want them to be running on different nodes. You want them to be running on the same stack, on the same node. And you can tell Docker, uh, you can tell Swarm to do that. Please run these two containers, this front end and back end application together on the same on the same node, and Swarm can do that. Dependency import uh, container configuration filters are about running a container where, where for example, you need the the port 80 to be available. And you tell Swarm, please run this where the 80 where the port 80 is available. If at some point uh, it, you try to run this container and in any of the nodes the port is not available, it will fail. It will say, sorry, I tried to schedule this guy, but no can do because there is no port 80 available. So try something else or yeah, just go to sleep because nothing else that we can do. So we talked about this. And now there is a swarm strategies on where exactly to put your uh, to put your <coughs> your containers when you want to run them? Say that you have a constraint that you want you want to run, for example, high RAM. You want to run a container on this server group or in this node group, and there are eight nodes available. Which one should Docker Swarm choose? This is where the strategies come in. Spread will evenly spread out the containers so that, so that the load that you're putting on your cluster is evenly spread out, if that makes sense to you. The bin pack will try to use, will try to put the container on the servers that have the most usage at the moment. So if there is a, there is a node that is really, really busy, Docker Swarm will prefer to put the container there. <coughs> Why you want to do that? Well, perhaps, you want to spare the resources of the other containers for some other use case. For example, you know that later on you're going to get a higher traffic and you want to keep the, the usage of those nodes. You just want to keep it there as a reserve. And at some point when the high uh, traffic in your site kicks in, then you will start using those ones. And random is basically just no computation. It will, okay, here a container, run it, and it will, okay, there. Oh, no, wait, no, I could not run it because the server is full, sorry, and then it fails. Or, oh, here, it's available, I guess, and it will try to run it there, and then the container runs, and it works, or it may not work. Now, demo time. <clears throat> yes, the what server with the beard. Yeah, what about the registration discovery and, and routing of the services, how it's handled, because... Right, that is not handled by Swarm. You will have to bring your own tools. Oh. Right, so for example, you... Because it doesn't make, I mean, you need that, otherwise it can't use this. Correct. What I've seen people using is the container body by the people from Joyant. 
There is also a uh, console. Yeah, console is really cool. Yeah, yeah, just uh, yeah, but but console by itself you cannot use it unless you modify your application. Mm -hmm. So, does anybody is everybody familiar with the concept of uh, service discovery? Who is not? Right. So sometimes you have some application that depends on your database, for example, but you don't want to manually configure where the IP is, or maybe you have a really complicated setup where you have this cluster of nodes, and you need somehow the application to find its dependencies. <coughs> well, how do you do that? The key is to use service discovery. There is a mechanism that will tell the application where is that resource that it's looking for. So the application just comes out and says, hey, database, database, and then the service discovery service is standing by. So what do you say, bro? What do you say? I need a database, bro. Post first database. Give it to me. And then it's like, yeah, I know where it is. Here. And then it gives the IP. Here. There is the IP of your Postgres database. And it's like, oh, cool, dope, bro. And then the application can start up, start inserting records, reading from the database, etc. Now, this process of the application saying, hey, bro, I need a database, you need to modify the application code. And not everybody has the time, the resources, or the knowledge to do that. So they came up with the idea of container body, which is you spin up a container. And container body is there, like a, as a vigilante. And it's like, oh, 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 this new guy started up. What is, what, is, bro, what is your name? What is your name? Well, my name is Postgres Database, and I'm listening on board 1234. It's like, OK, cool, thanks. And then it goes to the service discovery and says, Hey, yo, there is a new container running. His name is Postgres Database, and he's listening on port 1234. And then the service discovery is like, OK, cool, thanks. Then the next time that somebody comes up, says, Hey, Postgres Server, give me something. It's like, Yeah, I know about it because the container body, which is like the gossiper, the one that is the vigilante looking for everybody, looking, listening to ports and starting up and whatever, already told the service discovery where it was. And then you don't have to modify your application code. Hmm. There are other applications like traffic and traffic from uh, Emil. Uh, I cannot pronounce French last names. It's something fucked up and complicated. Uh, who created something like a reverse HTTP proxy that can hook up to console to do service discovery. It's, uh, it's crazy shit and it works really well. And there's also Fabio from the people from eBay, also for service discovery that can hook up to ETCD, Zookeeper, console, and he will do the reverse HTTP proxy for you. <coughs> now, the experiment that I'm going to be running today does not include service discovery. I'm sorry, please lower your expectations. So basically what I want to do today is I have a, I have a cluster of uh, one storm manager and four nodes, and I have this dummy application. It's a Go application that listens on port 8080. It receives a HTTP request, a GET HTTP request, and it responds with a status 200 and the text OK. That's all it does, nothing else. So what I want to do is to give it to Swarm, and I want it to run it somewhere. I don't care about which node. Just run my application, please. Just schedule my container if I may do the back reference. So let's see. We can, OK. So Swarm is running as a Docker container. What's the configuration you look at just before you start? Do you have Swarm as a Docker container or a Swarm runs as a Docker container. Yes, but it's not running it, right? It's not what? In your current machine, it's like nothing is running. I just want to know the second. Oh, sorry. In my current machine, everything is running. Okay, I have a Docker. Yeah, that would be too eager of me. So you can see here Docker. Okay. Uh, just to show you real quick, uh, Swarm is running um, on port 4000. So basically you just talk as if you were talking to Docker. So you do Docker on port 4000, say uh, info for example. And this is the information of the, of the Swarm as a whole. There are four nodes, as you can see here. Swarm node one, two, three, and four, and they are all healthy. Tells you how much RAM you have available, a couple of tags, labels, the IP of the node. I mean, it's really basic information. There's not much, much, much more to this. 
Uh, and also this uh, command is a little bit long, so I'm just going to alias it to D so that I don't have to type docker-8, 4000, etc. So then if we do like this, so there is no docker container at the moment running in my cluster. So this is my docker swarm, nothing is running here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run uh, the demo application that I was talking about. So it goes like docker run in daemon, publish all the ports. The name is going to be test and the application is this one. So we go, so we do docker ps, well docker, docker swarm, right? So ps and it says that there is a, the, the application Mongolian gap is running from left by less, it's been running for less than a second and this is the IP and the port. And as you can see it's running on swarm node 3 and we didn't actually choose on which node to run, right? So I'm just with whatever method it uses, it will say, oh, there is a Docker container I need to run, and there is this uh, swarm node available, I'm just gonna fucking run it there. Good luck, bro. So if we take this IP and this port and we try it on the navigator, yeah, boy, there we go. Oh, yeah, it's working. Now, I have SSH into these, all these nodes, just to show you guys. Uh, let's see here in Docker PS what's going on. As you can see, there are two containers running here. There is a swarm, this is the swarm node, but there is also the Mongolian application that I was talking about, the Go application, with the ports exposed and all that with the name test. Um, let's, uh, let's just try to run it again, see what happens. Oh, the name is already assigned. Why is that? Well, you're talking to you're talking to Swarm as one Docker container, so you cannot think, oh, there is a, the test is running there, but not in node one, but in node three. So I guess I can have the two names equal, but that's not how Swarm works. It works. It manages the inventory of your Docker containers as one single thing. It oh. wants to make you treat Docker as one single point. Don't think of it as a, as a pool of nodes. You have to just have your Docker con your Docker daemon running somewhere which in the background has more resources available for him. But in the end, you're just gonna talk to one single guy. So we'll give it another name. There you go. And now if we check where it's running, test one is running on node uh, four. Okay, does anybody know why it takes so long to run? Because okay. you're in the background. Say what? Because you are inside virtual machine? Uh, that is one reason, but... Mm, it downloads the image from internet. Yeah! Ship your project is a nice GUI, web GUI, that, is, that sits in front of your swarm. And it's going to present you where, where, with all, all your containers running in this a nice interface. I'm going to show you that now. So here we can see uh, the swarm nodes are running. Swarm node. This is the swarm processing different nodes, and these are the different uh, Docker containers that are running there. And the cool thing about this thing that I really like is that you can go here, you can inspect, and there you can tell you, oh, where is it? Where are you? Here. It tells you the port configuration. So then you can access to your uh, to your service here. You just double click, copy paste, and then you open a new tab. Uh, you actually see it. Let, let's just try that. Boom! It works! Ah. Not that one. Let's, uh, let's get the managers happy with the stats. Oh. So there you go, you can see the spike of the, of the CPU, whatever, the memory didn't touch because it's Go and the memory footprint is pretty slow, pretty low. Right, there is another nice, uh, nice things to see in this interface. You can see here, for example, all your nodes and the health status, if they're working, if they're not. You can see how many containers they're running, for memory, the labels, and uh, this is, these labels, for example, if you want to deploy a container, you want to say, okay, this container has to go into the test environment, because obviously it's a container for running your tests or whatever. You, you can just uh, explicitly set that constraint. This level has to be set up in the Docker daemon, which kind of sucks, but they are trying to make it better in Docker 
But any more you tell Docker to you tell Swarm, okay, run this container, and the constraint is run it where the server has the label environment. And, oh, we have ten different uh, nodes that say that say that they are tests. Well, whatever, I don't care. Just just run it somewhere, bro. Just make sure that my container is running. Anyway, we'll just run it. The, you, these uh, labels are very uh, how do you call them in English? Um, arbitrary. So it can be just key value. It can be whatever. It can be foobar or it can yeah lols cat whatever. Um, this is pretty much it. All what you guys are seeing here is what is being exposed by Swarm by Swarm and Docker. This is by no means anything. They're not doing anything fancy here. It's just a web interface to what you can do from the command line or using the API from Docker. A couple of things that I would like to mention about uh, Swarm is that. Uh, it sucks in two different ways, in many ways, but uh, the two most important that I guess matter for production cases, because of course there's going to be always a sucky part of a product, but for most of the production cases it's fine. But in, in Swarm, for example, if you have the constraint that you have a dependency, you want to run a front-end and a back-end application, and the requirement is that they both run together, say, hey, I need to run these two applications right next to each other. It will try to spin up the backend application, for example, the backend <coughs> container, and it spins off and it's running quite well. But at some point, it tries to spin up the the frontend application and it didn't manage to run it. Well, it just doesn't run. But nothing happens with the backend uh, container. It just keeps running. So those cases are not yet figured out because uh, Swarm makes use of the Docker API directly. It's just a it's almost a wrapper for the Docker API and nothing else, so it, there's no such things of concepts like pod or like a server group that, like a smart server group kind of thing, if that makes sense. That's what I wanted to say about Swarm serving. Uh, and some credits because the icons that I found here are creative commons found from the Nuon project, so I just have to mention them here. Mm, questions? Yeah. So you just mentioned a few key differences with other orchestrators, right? Like, so you, the thing you mentioned looks to me that's not really ready for production, right? Because if you pick Depends like, on your use case. What is your, what is your oh, production you, use case? If it was at least the service to try to restart the container to fail. At least. <coughs> If it fails, like Kubernetes does that on Mesos, yeah. so, right? So I, I, I just want to know if any experience with this in production yet? I don't think so, right? Because uh, these limitations are really heavy, for, in my opinion. Let, okay, yes, it is, it is very limited. Again, it's just yeah. using again. It's, it's just a wrapper for the Docker API, so it's very limited to the Docker API. As for being production ready, it depends. It depends. There, yeah, I, I'm. I'm sure that most of the of the heavy heavy people out there, they want something like Kubernetes or even Mesos. Yeah. But if you are moving from a really old setup of whatever, and you want to try things out, a uh, Swarm is really really easy to set up. It's easier than this other thing. Yeah, yeah. And, and, so, and if you so kickstart, okay. Exactly, and if you know Docker, if your team knows Docker, then it's way easier to start with Swarm because Mesos and Kubernetes yeah. introduce new concepts that are difficult to grasp in the very beginning. Even if you know Docker already, the, the learning curve is pretty steep. Maurizio. What about configuration management? I mean, this this chef, this puppet thing, do you think they will survive with the oversimplification? Do you think there is still space to have a language that, like chef, defines like a model of a server deployment? Rather, you think that the oversimplification of that Docker and containers in general has brought is going to bring us back to bash? How do you get these guys ready? Well, uh, my idea would be to create images that contains as much as possible and you have a creation process and uh, my question is... How do you run Docker here? You how, do you set up, how do you set up firewall rules? How do you manage uh, the users that can access to the, to, the, to the servers? Right. 
I'm, I'm not saying use chef puppet docker yeah, or, or uh, is is a question. Yeah, yeah. How would how would you fix that? Right. So what you're saying is that this the 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 server containing Docker should still still needs configuration management. Correct. And um, uh, do you well, do you personally use a configuration management tool uh, for that, or rather? Yes. Go, uh, so all this. Uh, so the, my whole uh, uh, Swarm setup with the shipyard and Swarm and behind you need console for for the different nodes to find the Swarm manager. And for the managers to find the other managers, uh, for that I used a vagrant setup with different vagrant boxes running to different services, and I provisioned the vagrant boxes uh, with Ansible, right. because doing it manually with Bash would have taken me a long, long time. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay, Ansible. Thanks. Uh, what is the other question? Do you think about Rancher? I have no opinion yet because I haven't read on it. it looks sexy. I mean, I've seen it. It's like. It's like shipyard. <laughs> you got a trainer. <laughs> a range of trainer. <laughs> but yeah, that, that was the question. Okay, yeah, no, I, um, no I, I really have no opinion yet on it. Right. Okay. Still need to catch up with things. With shipyard, it looks similar to shipyard. So what does it do? Well, something sexy for managers with nice dashboards and... Uh, <laughs> Using using the com the command line tool for setting up different things is, is good because at some point you want to automate that and it's difficult to automate things if they are through a web interface because then you have to hack you have to use something like Selenium or Casper or whatever tool you want to choose to log in into the thing then the credentials and then clicking and then maybe if it changes uh, it's not very uh, how do you say it's not easy to work with but if you have something from the command line then it's, it's way easier and I and I would imagine then that Rancher OS offers an API for you to, to talk to it and then manage your containers and whatnot. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thanks, man. Nice. Thank you for your questions. Anybody else?